Well, I have 10 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. I think we're all ready to roll here. Um, I want to welcome everybody to our May Seniors Living Smarter Seminar webinar. Um, our topic, of course, today is understanding the cost of senior living. And before I would get into that, just a few introductions I want to make. Uh, we have a few new people on the call with us today, but I always want to remind returnees as well as new people that the Seniors Living Smarter Seminars are really intended to provide you with a resource, with information, and know who to contact. We say the purpose is to educate, equip, and inspire seniors to make informed decisions and empowered choices. And it's just so critical to have that information. I noticed on something that came across on my phone today, it was a peace of mind day and do something nice for yourself. Well, I think one of the nicest things you can do for yourself is to have information and feel in control. You, we as seniors are making the decisions. If you choose to defer to adult children, that's your choice, but you know we're, we're the decision makers and we want to equip you so you'll have information for your decision making and for sharing with your family. And we're in our fifth year of these. We really enjoy doing the seminars. And a little update, we're still not sure about the June seminar, if we'll be able to go live or not, but go ahead and register and we'll let people know um, surely by July. But as I've said before, uh, First Presbyterian, who has graciously been our venue for the seminars for five years now, um, till the year of COVID, and they had not only to deal with COVID, but water damage in their lower level. That's where we go in and out. And so the church is just now beginning to reopen. They resumed worship at the end of this month, at the beginning of this month. And hopefully, well, there are other um, groups that they serve and allow to use their building will start next month. So we'll keep you informed. Uh, when we are able to go live, we look forward to that interaction. We will still record the seminars and put them on our blog post. Whether or not uh, we'll transmit live, I don't know for sure about that, but we'll, we'll have them up there because I know people said they want to go back and re-listen or people who aren't able to join us on the day of the, the seminar. So um, that's what Seniors Living Smarter is all about, keeping people informed. And to help make this possible, we have our sponsors who help support this. And I always want to recognize our sponsors. Jeff, can we put that slide up? Maybe. Um, here we go. So the, uh, okay, we'll get to those just a minute. There we go. Okay, great. Uh, Silver Key Benefits. Uh, and today, several of these will be on our, um, our panel. Uh, Steve Jakovic is representing Silver Key Benefits. He'll be a panelist. Vera Bank, you heard last month, our spotlight was on Vera Bank for you know, planning for estates and financial planning and so on. We had Will Bouton with us. Uh, Visiting Angels, we have Ryan Seawright with us today. I hope I got your name right, Ryan. Uh, if not, you'll straighten me out. He's one of our panelists today, as is Christy bryant Schuler from the Wesleyan. And the other sponsor is myself, Seniors Living Smarter Services. The way that we are going to start introducing our sponsors, one each month, will be with a little spotlight. So Jeff, you want to play our introduction to our Seniors Living Smarter Services. Oh. Can you get the audio up? How come in practice session things always work just right? Let me just go ahead and give just a quick introduction to Seniors Living Smarter Services. Um, the Senior Living Smarter Services in partnership with my real estate business Really, we provide coordinated, comprehensive downsizing services. What that means, we're a one-stop shop 
to help people from even helping determine where they might be moving to, but especially with move management, sorting, organizing, coordinating with the mover to really provide the best service we can, looking at the uh, resettling. We often focus on, okay, so sorting, now what is it I'm gonna take with me? I'll get the movers and they'll unload it. Another critical part of the transition is the unloading, the resettling. And so if people are making local moves, we can provide assistance to that with that. The goal is to get you into your new place as quickly as possible with as few boxes to trip over as quickly as possible. So uh, that's the move management part. The movers are included in that. Liquidation, getting rid of the stuff you no longer need. It's a challenge. I have a great team who works with us on that and offers a variety of options from estate sales to buy out to uh, online sales. So we all come together. And of course, with property prep, I have people who work with me on that and then the real estate. So we can coordinate and it really does reduce the stress to people and love to build a relationship. I have a great group of people who we work with and we would look forward to serving you when you're ready to make that transition. So that was my spotlight. We did not get to listen to. Um, but now let's go ahead to, I think I've covered the introductions. Oh, for the people who are new, our format is that we will talk to our panelists. The, it's an interview type situation. And if you have questions along the way, if you will write them down at the end, we will have the opportunity. You can click the little raise hand button. Um, I think it's on the bottom of your screen and we'll call on you or if something comes up along the way, you can go ahead and raise your hand to save your spot. But we like to go ahead with the plan presentation because often we find the questions get answered along the way. Um, so that's kind of the way the format will be. And before we start with the panel, just so uh, I have some a special thank yous. Uh, Jeff Cramp works with us on uh, and getting the Zoom up and running is, it's still, I know we've been doing it for a year, but it's always a learning process. And I appreciate Jeff working on that with us. Uh, Brielle Gard, who has been working with me now for almost a couple of months. Um, she's in my administrative assistant, a wonderful researcher, problem solver. And uh, so we're delighted and appreciate her support in enhancing the seminars, webinars, hopefully return to seminars soon. Okay, I think that kind of gets the housekeeping out of the way. Um, so our topic, understanding the cost of senior living. You know, as we age, we, we want to make sure we have enough money to live life to the fullest. Um, the challenge is that often people don't have accurate or true information about what the cost will be. We kind of overgeneralize. Oh, those communities are so expensive. I just can't afford to live there. Well, sometimes it would help to get the actual information. So what we're wanting to do today, and we'll touch a little bit about services that can be brought into your home as we talk about the cost of senior living. Um, the importance of being prepared, planning, how much, and, and so we've already talked and, and you're, many of you are working with your financial planners so you know how much money you will have. What we're really focusing on now is the other side. What is it going to cost? And so we have a panel of experts today who will help us understand this. And um, before we go to our expert or panelists, I, our panel of experts, I want to just share some information. Jeff, could we put up the screen about the cost of senior of living? There we go. You know, when we say, oh, living at home. And so we need to consider this in terms of if we add on home care or home health care. But this is comes from uh, national figures, but it's helpful to look at. Now, many of you do not have a mortgage, so there's a savings to you. But these are monthly uh, expenses that we've gathered from a variety of sources, websites. Brielle's worked on it for us for this. I appreciate it. So without including your property tax or what other things you might have, other forms of entertainment or whatever, uh, you know, it's, it's costing us about 30, you know, say $3,300 just to keep up our living in our own home. So for some people, the reason I mention this is I've heard people say, well, 
you know, I just don't have any extra, I, I can't afford that community. Well, remember, those expenses are going away if you choose to move to a community. Now, if you're living at home, yes, you have these expenses and then you will add in your, um, of course, the, the assistance you need. All right, so now let's go to our panelists. I'm gonna ask you to briefly introduce yourselves and share a little bit about your services. Oh, my other disclaimer. We always say this is not a marketing seminar. It's not, but these uh, vetted our panelists and our sponsors, people who are committed to education and really working to provide seniors the best planning tools and so on. So they will be speaking as representatives of the senior industry, the area they are involved in. But of course, obviously case in point, they'll be looking at their own um, business or service too. So I just want to say we're wanting to build information. So now let's get started. Um, let's start with aging in place. You know, there are many factors uh, that go into, oh good, so we had pulled to, and we're going to save that slide for just a minute. If we talk about aging in place, um, there are lots of topics. We've said we will continue with expenses of our home, but we may need some type of home care, someone coming in to help us with activities of daily living. And are we, in certain situations, may need a little bit more attention for some medical needs. So what um, I would like to do is I'm going to, oh, I didn't get you to introduce yourself. Sorry, we'll do that first, then I'll call on you. Ryan, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, and then we'll you bet. Um, Ryan Seawright, uh, owner, um, been an owner for about 11 years now of uh, Visiting Angels Living Assistant Services, um, office on the square, uh, live in Georgetown, and um, honored to be here today. And hopefully, this is your last Zoom one and be in person next time. So <laughs> that's exciting. I, I take, after the year we've all had, that that is, um, I, I that uh, that got me pretty fired up. So, well, we're, we're excited. We, you know, we, we appreciate you all staying with us during the Zoom and being patient with it, but we do look forward when we can all interact with our, our wonderful attendees. All right, let's hear from Christy Schuler, Christy Bryant Schuler. I'm still working on names. Thanks, Ryan. Christy, you want to just give a quick introduction? Unmute yourself. Gee whiz, I've done this so many times you think I would know that, but. My name is Christy and I am with um, the Wesleyan here in Georgetown. We actually provide um, independent living, assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, home health and hospice. We've been in the area since 1962 and we are faith-based and not-for-profit and we're happy to be here. Well, we appreciate the continued support of Wesleyan. We'll be hearing more um, from Christy and also from Ryan on our when we get into today's panel. Uh, Steve. Silver Key Benefits, you want to give us a quick introduction? Howdy, y'all. I'm Steve Dakovic. I'm the Managing General Agent for Silver Key Benefits. Uh, my partner, Howard Plansky, and I are both independent insurance brokers. So Medicare is one of the big things that we deal with, but long-term care, recovery care, all that sort of thing um, is another uh, major uh, approach that we, or, or uh, topic that we deal with regularly. So um yeah we're uh, glad to be here thanks thanks for being here and i know some of you attendees have appreciated the information howard and steve have served i uh, shared before in our blog post and calling attention to critical dates or resources so these are all wonderful people that we can turn to uh, and we also have on our panel today christy berger with texas home health christy could you introduce yourself hello thank you for for having me um, I'm Christy Berger. I've been a social worker in um, the Austin area for 22 years now, and the last 12 have worked for Texas Home Health Personal Care, working with seniors who are aging in the home. Okay, good. Thank you for being here. One of the things we will notice is, you know, a lot of these people are competitors in various ways. There's overlap. Wesleyan provides a whole gamut of services that overlap, but yet I love the way people work together. And you'll probably hear it coming out today. Sometimes when someone can't meet a client's needs, they refer to somebody else or we problem solve together. So I just want to salute people for working to serve seniors. Um, 
so now back to our, our starting with our questions. You know, we're going to have everything from the home care, like I said, home health care, we may need some type of home modifications. Those are things we'll save for the next uh, seminar. But right now we're focusing on what the cost is going to be. Ryan, let's start with you. What can we expect to pay if we need assistance with daily living? And when, so we're clarifying that this is not home health, and I'm sure you will address that, Ryan. But what kind of services do you provide when people need a little help to stay in their own homes? You bet. Um, activities of daily living, um, hygiene assistance, bathing, grooming, toileting, um, and uh, feeding. And so those are some of the things uh, we help get accomplished. Um, costs can really vary. Um, you know, um, we set a program um, for complete flexibility for, um, you know, you to decide what you want. Um, and that that's even more daunting sometimes than anything else. And so, um, uh, but really costs can be um, pretty varying. Um, you know, a lot, some people do private pay, um, just a person, and that's typically about $15 an hour. Um, and you just pay the person to do it. Um, I, I would more than likely advise against doing those types of things just because um, the protections that an agency can um, have in place, but most agencies costs are going to be around 19 uh, to $30 an hour, depending on how long you use them. Um, and, and costs are rising um, seems almost weekly now these days. I think the important thing for people to understand is what you said in terms of flexibility, meeting the needs of the individual or of the couple. Sometimes I hear, you know, how that rampant gossip mill runs around. Oh, we have to enter into a contract of four hours a day for, you know, so many weeks or whatever. But that's not back to getting the facts. Yeah, you know, you know, do research, uh, meet the companies, meet the people. Um, I like, I always say call weird hours to see if they answer the phone. Um, you know, we, we do 24 seven, 365 um, for that reason that, you know, um, mom breaks a hip on a Friday night at 8 p.m. Um, and, you know, um, this is a 24-7, 365 job. And so, um, uh, you, you know, your mom's broken hip doesn't decide um, the day. And so you, you have to um, figure things out and um, talk to, um, interview, um, go through those processes and feel comfortable with what decision you make. Um, um, and so uh, shop around, talk to different people, figure things out, um, um, and don't just settle and go forward. Okay. So that 24-7 that is so critical for people to know that they can turn to people to get help then or to get on the list. Of, and I don't mean on a wait list, but okay, who? this is a service I'm going to need starting and you all will work together to provide that. Okay, so we're seeing for home care, activities of daily living generally 19, 20 to $30 an hour. So I'm, and there's flexibility how many hours, okay? Uh, Christy Berger and Christy Schuler. Um, let, let's start with Christy. Uh, yeah. Let's start with Christy Berger. You represent, you overlap too, but you all bring in more, you can provide more of the home health aspect. Isn't that correct, Christy Berger? And can you explain that a little bit to us? Well, Texas Home Health has a medical arm, which essentially is paid for under your Medicare benefit. It's for intermittent services and they provide care. Um, they provide nursing care, therapy, occupational rehab, physical therapy, um, speech therapy, generally to those at post hospitalization that can't leave the home. But it's an intermittent service that is paid for under Medicare or Medicare Advantage plans. You just have to find, if you have a Medicare Advantage plan, <clears throat> you just have to find a provider, which most of them have contracts. Okay, and we'll hear more from Steve about maybe some resources for that. So thank you. And Christy, I know with Wesley, you represent all these areas too, but any other uh, thoughts you think that you want to call to our attention about the cost? 
for I home. I think Christy covered it with home health. It is covered by Medicare and your insurance. You've just got to make sure that, you know, those match up with the provider that you're using. And she mentioned all the therapies and I, uh, home health also provides wound care too. So, mm -hmm. so as said by and Christy uh, Berger, it is intermittent. It's usually in response to a discharge from a hospital or rehab or a condition that has arisen a little bit more support is needed for a period of time. So that's an important consideration there. Also, um, one, and we've talked about this at different times, but for people who are living in independent living and something may happen where they may need a little more assistance and what is perhaps the norm in independent living, they can bring in services to would you address that part, Christy? Brian? Sure. Um, independent living, as far as, you know, basically Medicare goes, looks at it as basically you're living in an apartment. Okay. Um, assisted living is very similar as well. Um, you can still access those benefits because independent and assisted livings are considered your home and are still covered under Medicare Part A. Okay. And therapy part B as well. So. Okay. So Christy Schuler, kind of looking at it from the community's perspective, you, you certainly want people to age where they are the bit most safest, most productive way. So as she said, the um, services are looking, that's your apartment, your home, wherever it is. And the community is fine with people bringing in services. Some communities have some on site, I believe. Or, and so Christy Schuler, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, we actually encourage um, ancillary services in independent living, and that includes home health that Christy was talking about and what Ryan was talking about, too, with um, personal assistant, visiting angel services like that. Anything that's going to um, improve your quality of life and keep you where you are longer, we want you to be able to, to utilize those services in independent living and assisted living because sometimes you're, you're safe where you are. You just need a little bit of help and you're not ready for that higher level transition. So those services provide that little bit of help that extends that stay in an independent living or an assisted living community. Okay, so you're extending your stay, having you safe and, and most productive way you can be. The other thing I wanna mention on the home care is the importance of the interactions. Uh, I've seen most of us probably know friends who have had someone to come in and provide maybe they just need help getting dressed in the morning or you know with like we say someone there when they're showering or to support them and it's amazing to see how then companionship becomes a really important part of the services ryan you want to say anything just kind of remind us of there are these jobs they do but part of it is the interaction with you bet family. i mean especially a widower or a widow um you know hopefully if we're doing this right and finding the right person you'll you'll get a new new friend new family member essentially and um, um you can get a nightmare too um and, and those people will help you appreciate the good ones as well so um you know it, it's um communicating um having as many people as possible help you um family members um it takes a community um, uh, of everyone to, to help someone um, from the experts of the home health to hospice to um, assisted living, um, as many people possible. And that's what's so exciting about getting the vaccine and getting these things out is everybody's, um, you know, um, getting back out and seeing everybody. And, um, you know, um, it, it's so important. And so um, um, having, having one of those people involved with the companionship is just just vital to help and improve someone's life. And they can take you shopping. They can go shopping for you. And I know I had a friend, they, they love their time together and they could run errands and, and yeah. keep the person engaged. And, and that is so important. Okay. Now, did we get, a, and maybe I didn't write it down. Did we get a figure or is it possible to give us a figure on the cost of home health care? Is there an standard hourly rate or is it very specific to the services needed? Christy Berger, let me ask you that question. It's covered by Medicare, 100%. Oh, oh I just want to so, Yeah. Okay. Then we, yes. Thank you. That's an easy one. Okay. You so I, I'm actually going to like um, riff off that a little bit. All right. Let's just say that original Medicare will cover it 100%. 
a Medicare Advantage probably will cover it, um, yeah. but you've got to get the prior authorizations. Um, and you know, if you've got questions about that, we've done seminars in the past on the difference between the Medicare and the Medicare Advantage, et cetera. And you're certainly more than welcome to ask, but, uh, but if you have like a standalone Medicare supplement card that goes with your original Medicare card, no issues. If you have say like a Humana or an Aetna Advantage plan, eh, um, I, I deal with issues where people's plans aren't paying for that stuff on a regular basis. So it's kind of read the fine print and get information specific to you. It may be different for me than for my neighbor. And I think that's one of the challenges. Sometimes we rely and think everybody's the same and it's not. So we have professionals to help us make sense of that. And uh, thank you for that clarification, uh, Steve. Okay, so we've talked about home care, home health care to help us stay in our homes as long as we can. Um, now let's go to the cost of senior living. A variety of way, topics we've had this year where we talk about independent living, assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing. So then the question becomes, what, you know, what is the difference? Let's highlight those because we do have some new people with us. Independent living, it is what it says, independent living. You're living in an apartment. Sometimes a, a community will have cottages, but you're free to come and go. It's your own apartment. The hallmark of independent living communities is that there's some type of food plan, some type of generally of transportation, there is a support system, uh, housekeeping, light housekeeping. So that's a little bit of how independent living is separate from 55 plus apartments and they're becoming popular. And that's another alternative for people to consider. One of my clients recently just moved to a 55 plus apartment. And as we were talking about her decision making, she said, I really like to cook or do my own meals. I don't want to be in a community with a meal plan. Well, we're all unique. We all have our own reasons for what we're doing. So that's independent living. You're completely independent, but you do have usually meals. And we'll come back and let Christy uh, Schuler clarify that. Assisted living, that's what we've been talking about when we need more assistance with activities of daily living, whether it be mobility, showering, toileting, meals, um, and most of the assist, well, there are different ways. It could be a la carte services. You could have different levels of service depending on what the needs of the individual might be. But assisted living, again, you have your own apartment. Then if the need arises, we have memory care. Uh, we have standalone memory care communities. We often have memory care in uh, secure wings or sections of assisted living and security, secure environments, one of the important things there, also activities are provided. So independent assisted memory care. And then if skilled nursing is needed and that would be the, the level where, I guess that's most really like what we used to think of the nursing homes, but um, we're, those are the different levels there. So um, Christy, can you fill us in um, on what we might anticipate for cost? Um, at, at, the, at the different levels? Yes. Um, independent living starts an average starting based on a, a smaller apartment, a single occupancy is going to be around $2,900 a month and it will include the things, Virginia, that you mentioned, the transportation meal plan, all the utilities, housekeeping. Um, assisted living starts at around $4,700 and it can go up to $8,000 depending on the level of services that you need. Um, memory care starts at around uh, $6,000 lower 6,000 range and skilled nursing, which is your traditional nursing home that you're thinking of is about $300 a day. You know, when you say a day, <laughs> that makes it more palatable perhaps than um, yeah, a daily rate there. Again, we want to keep, you know, people in the environment, least restrictive environment possible. But there are times we need to move to a, a different level of care. Um, so we, we said, you're giving up your home mortgage if you have a mortgage, you're giving up your insurance, utilities, the upkeep of your home, your HOA, if you're in an HOA, 
your groceries. So you're saving money. We had our uh, little chart up a while ago. I think our number that we said you were saving was around $2,900 a month. So that that's a consideration is actually more by the time we add in uh, our entertainment or other hobbies and so on. Um, one thing that affects the cost too, or, you know, Ryan in you know, and really uh, reminded us the importance of interviewing, like we're looking for home care, what's a good match for you, what services are offered and so on. The same thing with communities. Not all independent communities are the same. Not all assisted living communities are the same. So once again, people need to do your homework, research the communities, not just the cost, but what kind of services are provided? What is the environment? Um, Christy, anything you can add to help us understand that, you know, there is a wide variety there, both uh, pretty wide variety in cost, perhaps, but especially in the kinds of services that are offered? There is a wide variety in the cost. And, and like you said, at each independent living, I, I kind of equate it to touring. Um, when you're looking at communities, especially independent and assisted living, it's like picking a college. You're going to look, you're going to go to different campuses, you're going to get a feel for that and see if you see yourself in that community and what they include. Because we all do the same thing, but it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And so you're going to be saving money in the long run if you think about what you're paying for, because you're paying for food, you're paying for socialization, you're paying for safety. Um, there's continuing activities, transportation. There is, there's so much to be gained by joining a community, but it is a process. Uh, mentally when you when you're at that point making that commitment making that decision and when you've made it you've made it you've found the right place for you and that's what we want people to really understand just one thing I I think I because it really stood out in my mind when I became involved in in this type of work um meal plans I just get kind of a a because they're such they can be so different Mm -hmm. and some people don't stop to realize that and it may not matter to some people but you'll want to ask what their meal plans are do you get a voucher you have x amount of dollars and you go through a buffet line and get it checked off or do you subscribe to a plan where i'm going to have two meals a day or one meal a day and how are the meals served what type of dining opportunities are there there a group of home a group of communities where they're really committed to the social engagement all meals are well just coming out of covid we're returning to this but meals are served family style there's a breakfast hour there's a lunch hour there's a dinner hour you sit at a table usually for four they want to promote the interaction and some people like that that may be the very best thing for you others want more flexibility where there may be a variety of dining hours uh, opportunities. You have a dining room, you have a bistro, you know, people can, and different ones, and, and there are other communities represented by our attendees. So that's something I think is helpful for people to think about uh, what works best for you. I guess it really hit home with me when I was visiting communities several years ago, and I'd just been to the one where we would lunch, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and I was at another community where it's a very open plan, and it came up about the difference. And so the person was pointing out to me, but what if you don't want to eat at 12 o'clock every day? I can go at 11 if I want, or I can go at one. The other community would be, but why go at 11 o'clock if there's no one there for me to be with? We want you to be with people. So it's all lifestyle questions. And that's back to doing our, our research and our, our homework about that. Um, okay, let's see. So Steve, you've given us some uh, tips there um, to be aware of. What about any other general information? How do people know? The one thing that always comes up is long-term care. What's it going to pay for? And can you give people kind of points to look for or be resource or what can you sure. Yeah. I, you know, there's there's kind of three different insurances out there that potentially deal with this. Um, there's some types of policies that we call short term care. Typically, those are going to pay for stays um, or you know, benefit periods less than a year. And most of those really focus more on home health care uh, because and those are the least expensive way to, to deal with it. Most people would prefer to stay at home. 
rather than be in a facility. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely some policies out there that you can get, even if you're not particularly healthy, that will pay for home health care. Uh, but uh, the age limit for getting them is typically about age 80. So, you know, once somebody's over about age 80, there's not nearly as many options out there, uh, which is where the whole planning thing comes in. Um, the long-term care policies, those have changed immensely over the past 20 or 30 years. Um, and, uh, you know, we've offered this before, we'll continue saying it. If you've got one and want to look at it and make sure you understand what you've got, uh, Howard or I are more than happy to sit down and look at that with you and just talk about it. A true blue long-term care policy right now today for somebody that's 60 is going to run somewhere between two to $4,000 a year, but it will pay for home health care. It will pay for assisted living. It will pay for a actual skilled nursing facility. And so, um, you know, it's, it's the most powerful uh, of those type policies out there, but it's also definitely the most expensive. Um, there's some innovative ways to uh, approach this. Um, there's some, some there's, there's a long-term care is just, it's, it's a crazy long topic, but um, one of the key things that, that Christy mentioned earlier, and, and I'm gonna um, you know, go back to, is that if you just talk about getting better, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, that sort of thing, Medicare does a very good job taking care of that. Um, what Medicare doesn't do a good job of is the nursing facility, the long-term care. If you've had a hospital stay, Medicare will pay for the first 20 days, period, end of story. Um, but once you get past 100 days, um, you know, I'm skipping a bunch of details here because I don't want to go down to the weeds too much. Um, Medicare stops paying at that 100-day point. And so that's when you start having to look at Medicaid, self-pay. Um, one thing that I will advocate against is having the kids pay massive, massive amounts of money um, because... You know, when, when you start having kids spend down fifty to hundred thousand dollars of their assets, there's typically some better ways um, than than spending a bunch of next generation type money. But you know, again, that's uh, certainly an individualized uh, conversation for either me, Howard, your financial advisor, that sort of person. Now, okay, Medicaid, when you were talking about instead of having your kids spin down, we have this money if we spend it down. When does, there's a lot of confusion about what Medicaid, how people qualify for Medicaid or what Medicaid can cover. Can you give us a tip of the iceberg on Medicaid? Sure. Um, so there's a number of different programs out there that people call Medicaid. They're not all actually Medicaid, but, you know, it's, you know, like calling a, root beer, you know, hey, give me a Coke, but I'd like a root beer, please. Um, let's just say that from a income and asset standpoint, the point at which you start looking at Medicaid is um, if you're just talking about health, health insurance, typically 1,200 to 1,400 of monthly income for an individual, there are some programs out there that will help once you get at or below those, those levels. Yeah, wait, go back to that. So what, what, when you said twelve to $1,400 a month, what are, were you referring to? So once you are below about twelve to $1,400 a month, you can potentially get a program called Extra Help, which helps pay for prescriptions. And you can potentially get the state to help pay for your Part B premiums, which are $148.50 a month um, right now. I think you know, they're going to continue to rise. Um, but you know, just knowing that that's the threshold at which you begin to look at these programs, um, that's just on the health insurance side of things. On the long-term care side of things, um, that gets a lot more complicated. And honestly, one of the Christies can probably talk better about that than I, because you know, with the whole um, social worker and that sort of thing, she probably knows the Medicaid income limits um, and asset limits a lot better than I do. Um, there are definitely some programs that can help with in-home care through the state. It used to be through dads, but now it's just, I think, health and human services. Um, that's changed a bit over the past four or five, six years. Um, but 
at the end of the day, if you talk about where the really big bucks are, um, if someone ended up going into a long-term care facility, and let's just say they've got $200,000 in assets, IRA, 401, bank account, whatever. And let's just say they've got four to $6,000 a month in income. And it's a couple. I'm sort of kind of describing my parents, but without the assets, because um, they, they don't have that level of assets. Um, one of the things to understand is that the state doesn't want a spouse to be completely impoverished paying for long-term care. Um, so there's something called a spousal, a community spouse um, asset limit. And I believe the ballpark number is about 125,000 and some income. So what that means in English is if you're married and your spouse ends up having to go into a facility, you can keep the house, the car, about 125,000 give or take um, in liquid assets like an IRA, 401, whatever, without having to spend that down. Now, anything above and beyond that, you've got to self-pay until you get to that point. But once you get to that point, the state will step in and they'll help out and they'll say, okay, well, at this point, you're gonna pay this much of it, we're gonna pay this much and that protects your assets, that makes sure that the person still living at home has some money to live in or to live on. And um, so, you know, it's, it's not nearly as harsh as it was, let's say 10 to 15 years ago. Um, the, the rules have um, been relaxed to make things much more livable because, you know, when, when you see somebody going into a facility, spending all their money, person then passes away, and then the, the survivor is left with nothing. I mean, that's just not, that's not what we as a state, as taxpayers, as citizens wanted. So we changed it. Okay. And, and that is community spousal support? Exactly, the community, the, the, the magic word is community spouse. If somebody wanted to Google some of this stuff and look it up, they would Google Medicaid community spouse. And that would pull up the income limits, the asset limits, and that sort of thing. Um, I would tell you that Googling it's great, but talking with somebody that really knows it well is even better. Um, and Christy Berger, that, that, is that you that would know those? Let's start yeah. with Christy Berger, you want to address some of that and give some even real life stories to help people make sense of all of this? I, I can only say, so the, so I know there are folks who, uh, elder law attorneys are probably the best um, people to consult about division of assets and um, knowing the laws about what you, know, what you can keep and not keep. There's, um, I, I, when you're looking for that, I would look for, um, there's certified elder law attorneys, CELAs. Um, you can Google that and then they'll all be listed they're really the best people to help sort through um, how to, to look at the different entitlements and make decisions um, regarding your specific situation, whether it's a spouse or a special needs child. Um, <clears throat> there's also the Area Agency on Aging. They can, there's a benefits group with them that they um, can give a good gloss over so that you have at least you know, at least you save an hour at the lawyers, <laughs> not starting from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and then um, there are a few people, um, veterans, the Veterans Benefit Services is, and the one in Georgetown is amazing. Um, they can help folks work through those, those things as well, because there are two different veteran benefits that assist people in the home. And, um, they also know how to weave around Medicaid and the other, you know, the other types of entitlements that are out there. Great. So, sure. so, so specifically, one of those groups would be the DAV, the Disabled American Veterans. Um, some of the guys with the American Legion potentially can help mm -hmm. as well. And the the benefit Christy was talking about is typically the aid and attendance benefit. Um, is there another one out there that I'm not? Um, well, actually, the home health aid benefit is used just as much. Um, okay. 
or more because it's not the aid and attendant really is, I think it's $127,000. You can't have more than that, not counting your homestead, et cetera. Um, so there's a few more strings attached, the home health aid, you know, and the nice thing is that it is basically like six hours a week for people who, who just need to get a bath, you know, and their dishes cleaned and their, their laundry run. It's, it's a nice little benefit that's um, covered for vets who are still visiting the VA. Um, and then there's some exceptions to that. But, um, and the great thing about that is that it's all the private pay companies like Visiting Angels, like Texas Home Health Personal Care, um, who are the vendors for the state. So you're getting a level of care um, through that program that's, that's comparable to private pay. I mean, the types, the types of people providing it. So you're getting some financial assistance, but within a probably a select group of vetted qualified professionals, you can still right. use your own who agency right. individual, and that's important to know. So, okay, good points there. So I know for some of you, we're stirring up a lot more questions. You're like, oh no, I don't know what that is. Well, then that's where you need to let us know your questions, or if it's something that one of the Christies can answer, Steve or Ryan can answer. And we, these are great resources. We will be sending out an email uh, early next week that will give contact information for our panelists today. So if you need to contact them directly. Um, you, Christy Berger had mentioned the elder law, certified elder law attorneys. We've had a couple of the attorneys on previous panels. I'm glad, great, glad to share their names, but the importance of people who know their particular area. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, well, I know when I'm going to switch to a couple of questions that people had emailed me earlier. And when we were talking about you know, spending down the money, uh, one person said, so if I move to a community, but I run out of money, what happens? And you know, those questions can be interpreted different ways. Is it literally there is no, or is there a monthly limit? Uh, and I know, in fact, I'm gonna go back to Christy Schuler. I know the Wesleyan has a unique perspective on this, but first, can you talk about just general industry? Uh, well, maybe anyway, then whatever you would like to share with us about Wesleyan and how you all can potentially respond. Specific to our community or just communities in general? Well, first, go communities in general, then we'll come back to you. To I us. think it, you know, as sad as it is, it, it's just like with any service and it, that we have, if you can't pay for it, you can't stay. And so um, there, there's not a whole lot of leeway with a lot of organizations. There are organizations out there that um, are faith-based and not-for-profit, like the Wesleyan, that um, provide benevolent care with parameters, obviously. But the Wesleyan is the only one in the area. There are others with throughout the state of Texas. And, and I think it's something that I, it's great that Steve is on the panel too and can help with different programs that are available if you educate yourself. But it's just like if you live anywhere, if you can't afford to live there, then you, you've got to go. I mean, and it's harsh and we know that. But that, so being aware but it's also back to having a long range plan. And, you know, when we've got the people, the financial planners or elder law attorneys can do some of this, but okay, so I am, I'm 70. Now, how many more years is my life expectancy? What do I, you know, how do I plan ahead? So it's, uh, it's ne not too early to start and it's never too late. I mean, like you may say, well, I'm 85, but you know, is that going to do me any good to plan now? Well, yes, it is. So that you know, it can help you look at how you, your assets will last. We don't like to think about, okay, that actuarial table, how long am I going to live? But you know, we are living longer. And so we're gonna to have to stretch those dollars out that then can impact decisions along the way of how much I want to spend while I'm going through the process, okay? That was one of the questions. So I hope that answered for one of my uh, attendees who had sent me that question. Um, now, another community related question. I know, well, after COVID, of course, things have changed a little bit, but when there have been the wait lists and some people move into one, 
they have a, a targeted community. They move there, they take a smaller apartment because they want to get their door in the community. And then whatever it can work out when they move to a larger apartment. Or what happens if I move into a two bedroom apartment and say I'm married, but if my spouse passes away and I no longer leave, need those two bedrooms, can I switch or, or what happens there? Sure, it's pretty standard in the industry to have people internally move. And you touched on people will, just to get into the community because they're ready to move, especially with the housing market the way it is right now, I've seen a ginormous, I don't know if that's a word to use, but a huge uptick in people calling who are ready to sell their home and they wanna move now, but I don't have that two bedroom or I don't have that cottage. And so there is always the option of taking something that maybe you know you don't want right now forever, but it'll work in, in, in the short term. The, the caveat to that is if you're on an internal list, you're gonna move quicker than you are an external list because we offer, and this is pretty industry standard too, not just specific to the Wesleyan, we offer upcoming apartments internally before we do externally. And, and right with downsizing too, some people figure out that that statistic really is true, that you really only live in 600 square feet of your home now, no matter how big it is. And so they don't wanna pay for that extra study or that extra bathroom, and they'll go ahead and downsize to save some money. Okay, a good point. And we know that the real estate market is crazy. Generally, homes are selling very quickly at a very nice price. So it may be the right time. I mean, that's very, I think after COVID, uh, for a while, people were reluctant to move. But now as things have opened up, so I have seen, I've had a lot of clients who, well, I've decided the time is right. I need to go ahead and move closer to family. I'd really like to stay in this area where my social network is, but after being locked down, whatever, for almost a year, they said, I think in the long run, I need to go ahead. So it's interesting to see how this is impacting decisions of people. Uh, I know some situations where people were concerned about being locked down in the apartment. So they wanted to move in with family. Well, that may work for a while, but sometimes that doesn't, it's <laughs> a long run solution, uh, even though it's what's all done with good intentions. But that decision of when to move, uh, talking to a woman yesterday and she's, I loved her reasoning. She's, she has it. Okay. I'm, it's next year. I think, I believe I'll still be healthy enough to engage in all the activities and do everything. And that we, so, you know, it's the challenge. If you're going to move, move before the crisis occurs. That's what we, we often deal with that, you know, you wait too long. And by that, I mean, you're not able to really acclimate, participate as much in the community, or you may, skip independent living and go to assisted, whereas if you're already in independent living and bringing in supplemental resources, you could stay longer if that would be your choice. So there are lots of factors. Okay, well, those are some questions. Let's go ahead and if our audience, or before I ask for questions from the attendees, panelists, any other great words of wisdom you wanna share? We covered it all and you have sufficiently educated us. That's great. Um, okay, let's see if we have some questions from our uh, attendees. If you will raise your hand and then we'll be watching so we can work together to get you unmuted. We'd love to have, okay. Good, let's see here do we have. All right, Kim Peel, you have your hand up. Would you? And mute yourself, allowed to talk. Oops. Okay, I ask you to unmute. Are you there? There, Kim. Yes. Good. Okay. You had a question or you had your hand up. I'm sorry, the hand up was by mistake, but my question is um, in independent living but you don't drive, how much service is provided, uh, such as a grocery store, a uh, church is very important to me. How, mm, how does this translate into independent living or- Good point, Kim. Uh, 
So Christy Schuler, you want to respond to, and again, it's going to vary between communities, but can you give us some understanding when we say transportation is one of the hallmarks of independent living communities, what does that mean? What kind of transportation? I can speak to you, um, <clears throat> specifically our community. I know, uh, Virginia, like you said, it's going to vary. We all do the same thing, but it's how you do it. We actually have transportation every day of the week. We do shuttle buses. Uh, we alternate grocery stores, Brandles versus HEB. But we also, uh, our transportation, I think it, it's a hallmark, but it's also a shining stone for us. We will take you to church on Sunday. Um, we'll take you to doctor's appointments anywhere in Georgetown. If you are a veteran and you need to go to Temple, you need to go to VA, we'll do that. We schedule that with our um, transportation department. And the West End has a whole fleet of vehicles, uh, sedans all the way to vans. So in every community is different, but we all do provide that, that transportation. And we do group trips on Friday. You know, we went to Green last week, stuff like that. I want to go to Green. Can I say? Thank you. I wanted to go. I want Michelle's job. It was so, they had so much fun. <laughs> okay, so that was a good inf information. Kim, I do know other communities where that's certainly a question to ask per community, but some will say, well, we do runs to doctors or hospitals on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so you're supposed to schedule your appointment in those days. So there is variation but certainly something to check out. And I like the way you, you're very aware of your, your needs, what will help you live a more engaged, fulfilled life and having help in getting around will be important. You get around fine, but it was a limitation for driving. So glad you're thinking of that. Donna King, you have your hand up. If you will unmute yourself. Hi there. Yes. My question was just a clarification earlier when you were talking about the home health as a, like in, your need for intermittent coming out of a hospital. And it was said that uh, Medicare will pay, Medicare Advantage the, you know, needs approval. I have a Medicare supplement plan. Um, I, I'm expecting that it pays, at least that's what I read in my policy. Am I, am I correct? Yep, I'm going to answer that one. Yep. Um, at the end of the day, Medicare is primary. The Medicare supplement just pays based off what Medicare decides. And as a general rule, dealing with original Medicare, they're just going to say yes. The, the rules in dealing with original Medicare are pretty straightforward and pretty simple. And, you know, while there used to be what was called a therapy cap, and there was some limitations on what they would pay, that changed in January of, I think, 2019, maybe 2020, just 2019. Um, and so now, as long as a doctor says you're continuing to make improvement, Medicare will keep on paying for home health care. Okay. Thanks. That's, that's what I wondered, because I pay quite a bit for this Medicare supplement. I wanted to make sure that it was still good. Yep. You paid into it or paying for it. So yes, get it. That's right. Thank you. Maximize it. Okay. Thanks, uh, Donna. Ingrid, you want to unmute yourself? There, Ingrid. Do you see how to unmute yourself? All right, let's see here. All right. So I, if you can unmute yourself, Ingrid, we'd love to hear your question. Or maybe she moved on. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can connect with her uh, shortly. Other questions, other hands need, that people want to bring to their, our attention. One more time for Ingrid. Okay, you're a quiet group today. All right. So you may be thinking of some more. Um, has this stirred any thoughts that our panelists would like to share with our attendees? Um, 
so the question about the Medicare supplement kind of prompted me to think about some things. Um, one of the things I always want to remind people is that with a Medicare supplement, you can change those literally any time of year. You don't have to wait all the way until you know the end of the year to change up a Medicare supplement. And the ballpark pricing on Medicare supplements right now is around $100 a month for somebody who's 65. And by the time you're talking to somebody who's in the, the age range of 75, it's probably up to about 150. So if there are people out there that are paying more than 250 or 300 a month for Medicare supplement, it's worth talking to Howard or me or someone just to check and see if it's possible to tinker with things, keep the same level of you know, coverage, but at a significantly lower price. Um, so, you know, just wanted to remind people that and make sure they knew that, you know, you know, three to $400 a month for a Medicare supplement is very, very expensive. And there's probably better options out there. Okay. Thanks for calling that to our attention. Let's see. Virginia, I think it's also, I think it's awesome that we have so many people come every month because they're doing what a lot of their peers are not. And so they're educating themselves about what's out there. And I think that's to be commended. I, I absolutely agree, Christy. Thanks for sharing it. And what I find interesting in, you know, between seminars or in consultations or whatever, and, and you know, hear people drawing on the information they have, or especially when they tell stories of what one of their friends said this, or they thought this, and I tell them that's not right. You need to get the accurate information. So we, yes, we certainly give a round of applause to our attendees. We, we haven't done a poll in a while to ask how many seminars or webinars you've been here. We've got some long-term people who keep coming and coming and coming. In fact, one of them has his hand up now. Carl, can you, are you, can you speak? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't know how the home equity loan uh, fits into the planning for all of this financing, you know, with the limits of 127,000 and your your home should should we enter into the uh, home equity loan business I forget the real name of it I got a mental block uh, should we get into that complication I think it costs 10 or 12,000 to apply for one and uh, it or just go along and I think probably meet with somebody to ask this question you know that could be a that good makes point. No sense. Um, you know, some of our financial people who've been with us before will. The other thing to consider is, I know in the past we've had some panels, and it may be reverse mortgage that you're reverse. That's what I meant, yes. Reverse mortgage. Yeah, reverse, I'm sorry. Oh, hey, Virginia, do you mind if I address that? Okay, go ahead, then I'll, go, go ahead, then I'll add something. Uh -huh. So there's some upsides and there's some downsides. Um, and if you want to stay at home as long as humanly possible, and you can't swing it without help, either because the kids are out of town or don't have kids or just don't want them necessarily involved or whatever the case may be. Um, a HELOC is a perfect, or not a HELOC, uh, which is that home equity line of credit. A reverse mortgage is a perfectly reasonable thing to consider. The downside to it is that it is gonna eat into the, into the, into the equity in the home and it's going to potentially leave less for your kids heirs whoever um the other thing is that i would say it's better if you're single than if you're a couple because if you're a couple um and you've eaten into the equity of that home it makes moving much much more difficult and so you know, it's, it's one of those things where, yes, it is absolutely a valid um, thing. Five years ago, 10 years ago, um, they were kind of the devil. Um, the, the rules and, and regulations on them have gotten much, much more stringent, and they're much less predatory than they were, you know, let's say 10 years ago. Um, but it's absolutely one of those situational things where if you know you want to try and leave the house to the kids, then you know, maybe not such a great idea, but 
it's an asset. It's a lot of money tied up in something that you don't have access to. And that the whole idea of that reverse mortgage is taking this brick of money that you've got that you can do nothing with and being able to chip some of that off with, while still having a place to live. So that, that's uh, an important point. We've had people who uh, wanting to stay in their own home or also if, um, a, if couples need different levels of care. So one spouse may remain in the home and the other spouse may need to go into, uh, generally if they're doing it that way, it would be assisted living or memory care that can be a source of income but weighing carefully and looking at your long-term goals. But I wanna emphasize what Steve said too. Um, reverse mortgages had a lot of bad press several years ago and probably deservedly so, but the product has been greatly improved. And so, you know, it is an option to consider uh, if that's something of interest to people. Okay, I hope that helped Carl. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, see, Donna King, you had a question. Or oh, your hand was up. Can, can you unmute yourself, Donna? Oh, I asked the question on the Medicare supplements. Oh, that's right. I got you. I'm sorry. I didn't lower your hand. Sorry. Thank you. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm going to um, muddy the waters in some way with another just for people who are the planners. I just don't know how long my money is going to cost or last. I don't know what it's going to cost me to live. Um, you know, there's another other types of communities too, and names can sometimes get us into complications, but we generally have been known as CCRCs, continuing care retirement communities. Now, like Wesley and others offer all levels of care, which is a tremendous benefit to people. The CCRCs, it's a contractual agreement. It does require a, a large down payment. You are making a commitment, you and they are making a commitment to provide you care rest of your life at your entry price. You do have to go in at independent living. You do have to prove uh, <laughs> that you're in, in good health. But do you then in a large, large uh, payment to, and then your monthly payments are similar to what they are in other communities. But if I go in now and say I'm in independent living for five years and something happens and I have to go into memory care and I'm going to end up there for 10 years or whatever, that price normally will go up considerably. If I'm in a CCRC, I will be paying my same price. Yes, there's a slight adjustment for uh, increase in meal plans or cost of living, but, and, then, and they, they do have, like I say, a large enrollment fee. I know some of you have uh, checked into some of that. Um, so just if people, and now there are more variations too. I mean, we, a large, when I say large down payment, uh, it, you know, at $500,000, $800,000 now, before you keel over that, um, when, if you, when you pass away or if you, and there's certain times you can withdraw from it, but generally 90% 90 90 of that goes back to your estate. That was the original plan. There are more variations now, um, but just something, if anybody is interested in that, we can help you with resources for that. Uh, we had had a representative from Westminster uh, on our panel a couple years ago, and just that idea of, I know I'm going to be paying this much for the remainder of my life, regardless of the level of care. Um, I'm working with a woman now who's moving to a community like that in Nashville. That's where her family is. She wants to be there. And, and she's in a situation where that's going to work very well for her. Uh, so just do that out as another option. We always want you to have, have all the information you need. Any other raised hands? Virginia, I just wanted to caveat your statement with Wesley and doesn't have a big upfront fee as a system. That's right. But some do. But yeah. we still provide all levels. Yeah, and that, I'm glad you clarified that, that. When we do have those communities with a contractual agreement for continuing, you're going to be paying at that rate. You yeah. have levels of care, which is important. And I'm not, I'm just saying there are different situations for different sure. people. And I know a lot of our attendees have said, I really learned it's important that I want to go to a community where 
There's independent, should I need it, there's assisted and memory care. Like I say, they can also all be freestanding. But when we talk about life care, the CCRCs just have a contract where you know what you're going to be paying. So something for everybody out there. So thank, thanks for clarifying that. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I want to give a quick update on uh, our Seniors Downsizing Smarter Club. We announced it, I think, at the last couple of webinars. Uh, and we had an introductory meeting. Some of you who are on the call today were with us um, on the first Thursday of this month. And we will be swinging into action in June. Once the Seniors Downsizing Smarter Club is people who we may not be moving right now, but we're actively engaged in that process of downsizing. So it becomes a support group. It'll be a small group. We'll meet once a month. We have great resources to share with people. But you know, when it's not therapy, but it is support, sometimes that I set my goal, oh, I go back to my uh, downsizing club next week. What have I done? Have I accomplished my goal? It's also helpful to know how other people are dealing with situations that seem so overwhelming. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a sign up on the or you on our website. You can get more information. But uh, I'm excited. We have a small group that's starting, like I said, the first of June. People will be adding to it. If you want more information, feel free to call me. And there is some information on the website too. Uh, okay, let's see. Jeff, could you put up our slide about our next meeting, our next webinar? Maybe. Okay. So we, well, I'll just, I'll tell you about it. So we will be having our next webinar in June will be the um, preparing for aging in place. And I'll have to have, I don't have a date with me, but Jeff will put it up here in a minute. So we're excited about that. Like I said, a lot of these topics are some overlap, but as you learn more, you bring new information. And so we, um, we want to be able to share that with people. But that registration is open. On, Brielle, is registration open online? I believe it is. It is not open yet. It will be after this seminar when we send out the follow-up email. It will be posted to the website. Okay. So are you prepared for aging in place? It's going to be different kinds of topics related to that. But I know so many people do want to age in place as long as possible. It is June 17th. Thank you. And uh, at this point, it will at least be virtual. Now, there's still a possibility we may be able to do it live. We're waiting for the blessings from First Presbyterian that they're ready to, to open their doors for us to resume our live seminars there. And uh, I believe that's where we will also probably not have our June downsizing club meeting there. It may need to be online again, but uh, hopefully that will be our home for that group too. Okay. All right. Oh, two questions, or maybe those are people I didn't lower their hand. No, I think we got all their questions. I have to learn to lower. Oh, Catherine Miller, you have a question. Can you unmute yourself? Catherine? Yes. Oh, good. Yes, I'm sorry. You have a okay, question? I, I wanted to know if someone could talk about safe transportation options in Georgetown for seniors who remain in the home. I have an elderly neighbor who was just told about two weeks ago that it's not safe for her to drive and I'm having to drive her everywhere. <laughs> so I wanted a little bit of help with resources. Okay, well, one thing that comes to my mind, of course, is faith in action. Um, and I don't know are you, how long, are you familiar with faith in action here in Georgetown? I am, uh, and there's a two-month wait list for rides, and she has signed up for that. Oh, okay. Well, that was a good good uh, resource. Uh, <laughs> I gave my idea. Others have, I know some peop people have used Lyft, uh, other ideas that people have, and that would be a good question for us to address next month, too. But um, any resources that people can provide? Or so more volunteers for faith in action that would help i'm not sure if they're all the way up into georgetown but uh, there's a program called senior access 
used to be called drive a senior but they changed the name because they do a few more things mm -hmm. um, it would be worth checking into senior access as well okay we do things like that as well we are not a cost effective way in doing that um i mean it's going to be expensive um you know we're just not a transportation um you know i have some seniors that are using uber um and things like that um as well um that seems to be a more cost effective but uh, definitely driving is always a problem on those, but Lyft, um, Uber, um, and things like that can help. Um, I believe what's the, what's the one that, um, Bell there's Uber. a transportation company, but there, it's just really hard on timing to get you. It, it's very, uh, cost effective. I want to say it's like $5, but I just, the name is escaping me right now. Um, I'll see if I can find it though. Okay. So now we're, or do we even have Go Geo? Do we still have that? Is that or, or were you referring to something different, Ryan? Anybody know? Okay, if we get information related to that, we could put it in our follow-up. Um, Brielle, since you you manage that for me, okay. So that's a good segue to join us next month. We'll try to have some information about that and other topics too. There are a lot of resources in our community and that's where still for aging place we have to look what are our long-term goals? Are we, how are we looking at our quality of life and planning ahead? And you know, it, it's hard when I think about transportation when you're the person needing it. It's also hard as a neighbor, we can't always take on all the extra needs of somebody. Uh, and we've got wonderful people doing that all the time, but I know they often need support too. So we'll see what other re resources we could come up with, okay? Otherwise, I think we've had a great webinar today. I wanna to thank the panelists very much. I think they probably generated a lot of questions in people's minds. Hopefully people have a takeaway uh, as we think about preparing. So we thought we've talked earlier or given you resources for financial planning. Now we got to think, okay, we, we, I'm going to have this amount of money. This is the kind of cost I'm going to be looking at. How does it all jive together? So we hope that is helpful. Otherwise, we will hope to see you June 17th and we'll let you know if we might be live or if we'll still be on the webinar. Oops, oh, I got another minute, two more hands. Okay, I'm not seeing those. Let me see. I think their hands, I, oh, no. Just a minute, hang on. I'm sorry, I didn't look closely. Jenny Mast, you have a question. We've got, we've got a little bit of time here, Jenny Mast, and then. Um, I really just was gonna offer something in response to that last question. Um, right. I'm, I'm in the same position, I'm helping uh, a friend and doing everything because uh, her family is out of the country actually but but a great resource I've just learned is church members mm -hmm. there, if the person does belong to a church um, in at least in several that I'm uh, just become aware of there are many many volunteers willing to take people places that need the ride for nothing for no charge so I just wanted to volunteer that no, it's a good point. And we know it's another source for getting to worship. And but also they often have some type of support group. So thanks for calling that to our attention. Ann Frolick, you have your hand up. And I think are you unmuted, Ann? I think I am. Are you hearing me? Yeah, you I hear you. Good job. Okay. This is not free, but especially if her neighbor doesn't do computer stuff very well. There's a organization called Go Go Grandparent, and I can send it, the information to you, Virginia. Okay. Um, and basically, you just have to call them up, and then they'll assign you to a Lyft or Uber driver. And when I did it, they uh, Go 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 Grandparent called up and said it was going to be a blue something or rather blue Toyota, and gave me the license number. So it all felt very secure. Um, but uh, if, yes, you pay for it and you pay a little extra for, for them. But anyway, I, I think it's a good possibility if somebody can afford it. 
Yeah, thanks for sharing that. You know, and that's the beauty of a community, even our monthly seminars. I know a lot of people who have followed up and asked a, with a question that was asked, and they maybe reach out to me, who was it who was wanting that? I have a resource. So if it's a resource that's appropriate to share with a larger group, please let us know, and Brielle can uh, put that in our follow-up. If it's something more specific to an individual, we can also um, get people connected for that information. Okay. Jeff, did I get it now? I know the, the hands that are up for people that I just didn't lower hands. I had to learn to do that. Okay. I think that's it for today. So look forward to seeing you on June. If you can reach out, if there are any of the services of our sponsors that you need, please contact me. I'll help put you in touch with them. Um, looking for downsizing, we're here to help you with that. So once again, thanks, Ryan, Steve, Christy, and Christy. And uh, we will uh, see you all in June. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.